For screen reader accessible documents, please click on the ADA Transcripts tab on your launch page. This link contains complete transcripts, action plans, and resources for each workshop. You may also access these documents by clicking on the Resources button. After completing the workshop, return to your launch page to complete the evaluation. Each workshop will be timed and tracked, and submitting the evaluation will validate workshop completion. Hi, my name is Lori Hazard. I work at Bryant University in Smithfield, Rhode Island, and I teach in the Applied Psychology Department at Bryant, and I'm also the Curriculum Coordinator for our First Year Experience Program. Um, in our First Year Experience Program, we work with students on different skills of what's going to make them successful in their first year of college. So one of the first things that we tell students that they need is the skill of time management. But I first want to talk about the idea of time management in terms of a, a title for our presentation because really I say to students it's not about managing your time, it's about managing your behavior. So one reason that college students may need time management or this idea of thinking about their behavior management is this idea of something called time on task. And this comes out of a business model. Time on task is really the question of how long does it take you to perform a particular task? And when you get really good at something, you get good at predicting how long it's going to take you to do something. Sometimes I have to write letters of recommendations for students. Typically, without any problems getting in the way, it takes me 45 minutes to write a letter of recommendation for students. I've been doing it for years. So if somebody asks me to do that for them, I'll go, OK, it'll take me about 45 minutes to do that. How does this function in a college environment? Well, let's say that you were in high school and you were given an assignment that you had to write a paper on a novel, a poem, or some kind of piece of literature in your English class. And as you walked through high school, it took you about an hour to do that kind of assignment. And you got really good at it. And investing an hour into that type of assignment would yield you an A or a B. So then you go off to college. You're a first year student. You're taking one of your first literature classes. You've returned to school and you're taking an English class. And you get the same type of assignment. You have to write a paper based on a novel or something that you've read. And you say, well, in high school, I did it in an hour. That's my time on task, and I was successful. I got an A or a B. Then you launch into this college assignment, and an hour goes by, and you say, oh my gosh, this is taking me a lot longer than I ever anticipated. And to write a college-level paper at the A or B level takes you three or four hours. So you, you're lousy at predicting time on task in college. That's something that you have to get used to as a new college student. You're going to be asked to do new things in college, more difficult things, and you're going to find that your time on task is going to be very different from high school. So college students might create their schedules and they know how to manage their time, but then that time on task factor and those motivation factors blow their schedule out of the water and they're left having to revamp the whole thing. So I want you to think about that and those, these are the kinds of things that we're going to talk about today to give you tips on how to manage that. Okay, so there are three tiers to time management. The what, the when, and setting daily goals and keeping a daily schedule. So I'm going to first talk to you about the what of time management. And what I say to students is, um, fortunately or unfortunately, the what of time management is what I would call professor-imposed and syllabus-driven. So it's professor-imposed, syllabus-driven. What does that mean? Well, the professor has already decided for you at the outset of the semester in each of your classes what you have to do for the semester. If you look at the syllabus, you are going to see papers, tests, quizzes, homework assignments, chapters, projects. So at the outset, you know what you have to do. You even know on your syllabus how each of those things are going to be graded and what the percentages of those things are worth. So you don't have a choice about the what of time management, what you have to do for the semester. And a lot of times students know what they have to do, but they don't necessarily do it. So there's a way to get students to begin to think about on a daily basis how you're going to approach the what. And what I tell students to do is take each of your five syllabus, look at all the projects that you have to do, and I don't care if you do this with a Palm Pilot, on your computer, if you take an old-fashioned paper and pencil device calendar, what I tell students to do is take the information from each syllabus and transcribe it into a calendar. That way, you can look at your calendar of your 15-week semester, or if you're on terms, it might be a little bit shorter, it might be 10 weeks. You'll look and you'll say, okay, on Wednesday, October 15th, I have a quiz in one class and a paper due in the other class. The only way to know if you're going to have assignments that are clustered onto particular days is to take all of your quizzes, tests, homework assignments, and transcribe it into one calendar. Now, I tell students this is going to take about two hours to do. What I actually do in my classes is I give the students the assignment that I described to you. That is taking all of the information from each of your syllabi and transcribing it into a calendar. 
But what you want to make sure you do when you do this is set very concrete, specific goals. So we're going to take a look at a calendar of a student right here who actually did a pretty good job with this assignment. And if you'll notice, on Wednesday, for example, she put um, Chapter 8, Anatomy and Physiology, pages 124 to 129. Why that's really good is that she had a beginning point of the assignment, start with page 124 and end with page 129. Most students, when they're setting up a calendar, if they're writing a to-do list, will put read anatomy and physiology. And I want to go back to that idea of time on task when we're talking about this, because let's take reading five pages in anatomy and physiology. You might look at that and say, eh, it's going to take me about 15 minutes to read five pages. Does that make sense? Sure. 15 pages, five minutes. But really, if you think of a course like anatomy and physiology, the subject matter is so dense, it might actually take an hour to master five pages of that material. So what you have to do with all of your classes is kind of do reading a couple of pages, see how long it takes you to do so you can predict that time on task piece. And remember to set really concrete, specific goals for each day like this student did. If you notice too with her calendar, toward the end of the week on Thursday and Friday, she has five or six goals set for each day. And at the beginning of the week, she doesn't have as many goals set. What I'm guessing is the student probably has maybe an outside job or she's involved heavily in co-curricular activities outside of her classes. And for that particular week, she had a lot of time on Thursday and Friday to get school assignments done. And so she didn't set as many goals for school assignments at the beginning of the week as she did for the end of the week. Take a look at Tuesday, for example. She put read chemistry section 3.4. Again, a really concrete, specific goal. It wasn't this vague, non-specific goal that she was just going to read chemistry. She set a specific goal. She's got a chemistry quiz at the end of the week. So what she's doing is putting the big goal at the end of the week, that she's got a quiz, and then at the beginning of the week, she's breaking down all of the little things that she has to do, that is all those short-term goals that she has to do to meet that long-term goal at the end of the week. So the challenge with this assignment is taking each of the pieces of the information in your syllabus and being really specific about what task you're going to complete with a beginning point and an end point, whether it be page numbers, section numbers, however you want to divide up your readings. So that is the what, and then if you notice, she decided when she's going to do each thing, what day of the week she's going to do each thing. So the what is the assignments, is the, and the when is what days of the week she's going to do it. There are a couple of other things that you want to consider when it comes to the when too, and that is what time of day you're going to get things done. So we have the what, the whole semester, the when, what days of the week, and then if you take your daily schedule, what times during the day are you going to do it. One last comment that I have for you regarding taking all of your assignments and all the information off of your syllabi and transcribing it into a calendar is that when you're doing this exercise, you're going to notice that professors have different styles in terms of the way they record things on their syllabi. One professor might actually give you the concrete specific reading assignment so that you're not going to have to figure that out for yourself. So Professor Brown might say to you specifically that you have to read X number of pages on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. However, you might notice that Professor Smith just says read chapter 8 and 9 this week. And if, for that professor, you're going to have to take your textbook look at chapters 8 and 9 and then decide how you're going to break up your reading, whether it be by page numbers or whether it be by sections. And again, you're going to have to consider your time on task, how long it's going to take you each day to break up those assignments. What I want to talk to you now about is when during the day are you going to get things done. So in other words, for example, that student had chapter 8 in anatomy and physiology, page 124 to 129. She knows she has to do it on Monday, but the question is, when on Monday is she going to get it done? And that's going to be driven by your class schedule, when it is that you have classes. And it's also going to be driven by something else. And believe it or not, it's going to be driven by your biology. So we're going to have a little mini biology lesson right now. Every human being has what we call a biological clock. Um, and that's called your circadian rhythm. We all say things like, oh, I'm naturally a night person, or I'm a night owl, or I'm a morning person. I do my best work in the morning. Everybody has those tendencies. Um, and I want to talk about how sometimes students can tend to work against their biology. There are actually there, these two nuclei in your brain. One's called the pinna, one's called the suprachiasmatic. So the suprachiasmatic is our fancy way for saying your biological clock. That is the clock in your brain that keeps track of that 24-hour cycle of life. 
and then there's the pinna, and the pinna detects light and dark in the atmosphere. And these two nuclei actually talk to each other, they communicate. So what happens is the pinna will say to the suprachiasmatic, hey, listen, there's light in the atmosphere, it's morning time, wake this per person up. And you'll notice that sometimes you'll wake up before your alarm clock goes off, and you'll roll over and you'll say, oh, it's six o'clock and my alarm clock set for seven. Oh, good, I have another hour to sleep. Well, isn't it funny how you wake up naturally at a particular time? And that's because your pinna notices that there's light in the atmosphere and says to your suprachiasmatic, hey, it's morning time, wake this person up. That's your circadian rhythm. And I want you to start paying attention to that because that's important relative to when you're going to decide to do your schoolwork. Okay, so I want you to think about how a typical college student goes about um, using their time during the day. And maybe not every college student, but I will tell you from my observations in working with college students over the last 20 years, this is what I see. Um, they roll out of bed to go to their 8 o'clock class, and they have a few classes, 8, 10, and 12, let's say on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And they've got time in between classes. You'll notice with your schedule, some days you probably have a two or three hour time block um, in between your classes. And what I notice that most students do is they hang out with their friends in between classes, they have a grand old time during the day, they manage to drag their butts to their classes, um, they go to their meals, they have their fun activities, and then they might start doing their schoolwork at 8 o'clock at night. And then they'll do their schoolwork, maybe some students don't even start until 10 o'clock at night, and they'll do their schoolwork until 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, fall asleep and do the same thing over again. Well, what I say to students is if you're doing this, you're really working against your biology. So let's go back to that idea of your circadian rhythm, that most people's high energy times are in the morning, because when that pinna wakes up your suprachiasmatic and says, hey, wake up, your metabolism is the fastest in the morning, and it slows down during the course of the day. As the light in the atmosphere wanes, the pinna says to the suprachiasmatic, hey, slow this person down. Um, Thomas Edison did us all a favor when he invented the light bulb because he gave us more light during the day, which keeps us going so that we can do our studying at night. But we are the best during the daylight hours, and I encourage you to try this experiment. Take two hours during the day to do reading in your class when it's nice, bright light, midday, and then take two hours from 10 to 12 at night and kind of look at those two situations and see, when did I get my best work done? When did I get most accomplished? And I guarantee you that when you're at your best is during the day as opposed to at night when you're starting to feel fatigued because the pin is saying to the suprachiasmatic, it's time for this person to go to sleep. Do that little experiment for me in terms of when you're going to get your work done better, during the day or at night. And I almost guarantee you that you're going to be more productive during the day. So I just challenge college students, don't work against your biology, work with your biology, and try to get most of your work done during the daylight hours. So now that you understand what a circadian rhythm is, I want to drill this down even a little bit further and really take a look at a weekly schedule and how you're going to use your time hour by hour each day. So what I'd like you to do is click on the attachment button and print out the weekly schedule. If you don't have a printer right now, you can go back and do this at a later time, but I'd like you to print out this handout and then we're going to walk through how to construct a weekly schedule together. Okay, so now that you've got that printout in front of you, what I would like you to do is first record your class schedule onto it. And your class schedule is what I call a fixed commitment. You know that over the next 15 weeks or so, whether you're on semesters or quarters or trimesters, that schedule is not going to change. You know that you have to be in classes at a certain time at a certain day. So what I want you to do right now is record your class schedule on. Then I want you to think about other fixed commitments that you might have. For example, you might be an athlete and you have practices every afternoon or you might do religious services on a weekend and you know those are fixed commitments. You might belong to some club or organization. So for right now, I want you to put what I call fixed commitments. If it's something like you work in a restaurant and one week you work on Tuesdays and Saturdays and the next work week you work on Wednesdays and Fridays, don't put that in because that's what I would call a variable commitment. So right now, fixed commitments, record all of those and then we're gonna take a look at your grid sheet from there. Okay, now I want you to think about what time do you tend to get up in the morning? What time do you tend to go to bed? How long does it take you to get ready? You gotta put things like breakfast, lunch, and dinner in there because inevitably you know you're not gonna be doing schoolwork don't, during those times. I also say to students, I can remember in college I was a law and order junkie and that was on at 
10 o'clock on Wednesday nights. I knew I wouldn't be doing schoolwork at 10 o'clock on Wednesday nights. Okay, I'm not implying to put every favorite TV show onto your schedule or put all the time that you're going to be doing Facebooking and things like that onto your schedule, but you do know that there are certain things that you're going to be doing that are going to take you away from your schoolwork. So within reason, think about some of those leisure activities that you tend to do. So I know for me right now, I wouldn't be putting correcting my psychology homeworks on during a time my favorite TV program is on because I know inevitably I'd end up in front of the television. So within reason, think about those things that you like to do, those leisure activities that tend to be habitual, and kind of just plug those into your schedule so you can kind of see what you're left over with after you've put your fixed commitments into your schedule, after you've put your breakfast, lunch, and dinner, going to the gym, getting ready for school, commuting time in between things if you're a commuter student, any of those kinds of things that are going to take away time from actually sitting down and doing your schoolwork. Get all of that stuff plugged in and let's see where we're at at this point. Okay, so now that you're done putting in your meals, your commuting time, and those habitual leisure activities that you tend to do um, every week and every day, I want you to look and see what kind of time I have left over. And you have to decide when you're going to be doing your schoolwork. And I usually say to college students, everybody needs to take at least one day a week off, otherwise you'll constantly be operating in burnout. And for college students, I think a good day to do that is a Saturday. So see if you can kind of Take Saturday out of the picture and look at the rest of the days and can you find at least, at the very least, on the low end, 25 hours a week where you can do schoolwork. Now that might sound like a lot, 25 hours a week for schoolwork, but there's something in higher education called the Carnegie Standard and that is professors expect students to be studying three hours for every hour in class. So if you carry a 15 credit hour course schedule, the expectation is for you to be doing 45 hours of work a week. So that's why I'm saying on the low end, see if you can find 25 hours of time left over in your schedule to do schoolwork. And on the outside, can you push it up and see if you can squeeze in 45 hours a week? Not always easy for students to do to find that kind of time. But believe it or not, there is a way to find a well-balanced schedule and still kind of stick to that Carnegie standard that professors' expectations drive. Okay, so 45 hours a week, you're probably saying, this lady is crazy. Where am I going to find 45 hours a week outside of my classes to get my school work done? This is nuts. Well, I'm going to challenge you to think about something that I call the 888 formula. So I'm going to say it is possible to have a balanced life of work, leisure, and school. So let's think about this. You have about eight hours that you need to sleep a night. There are 24 hours in a day, right? And I say to students, don't cut out the eight hours of sleep. Your body needs time to heal and rejuvenate. You need that for a healthy lifestyle. You need that so you don't get sick. So eight hours of sleep. Eight hours of time put towards school. You're in classes for about three hours a day, give or take, and you need to put about five hours a day into schoolwork. If you multiply that by six days a week, you've got 30 hours. Then there's eight hours left for leisure time. Now, what students say to me is, what if I have a job outside of school? What if I have other commitments like family? Where am I gonna use that kind of time to, for my schoolwork? And I say to students, unfortunately, school is a sacrifice, and it may be that you are gonna have to cut into your leisure time a little bit to give to your other commitments. So you're gonna probably have to cut, if you're a student who has to work, or if you're a student without side commitments like family, you're probably gonna have to sacrifice your leisure time while you're in school. College is a big commitment. I also have student athletes say to me, well, what if I'm a student athlete? Where am I gonna have my leisure time? Again, being a student athlete is a huge commitment. So those students are gonna have to put eight hours into classes and homework. They're gonna have to put eight hours into sleep. And the rest of the time, they're gonna have to put in their athletics and what little time that they have left over is gonna be their leisure time. You need to get into the mindset that college is a huge sacrifice but you can balance your time with the 888 formula. I say to students, think about it. You have to sacrifice for 10 or 15 weeks. Then you have a break, then another 10 or 15 weeks. So if you can stick to that 888 formula for that fixed amount of time for that 15 weeks, there are always little islands of vacations in between. So you can make it for that particular amount of time functioning on the 888 formula. Okay, so um, now that you have a handle on your weekly schedule, your daily schedule, what you have to do, I'm going to give you some tips to help you with following through because that's actually the hardest part of doing all of this is following through. So the first thing that you want to 
kids think about is plan for a suitable place to study and that means find a place that works for you students tend to gravitate toward studying in their rooms and let's be realistic about this what's in your room your beds in your room what do you associate your bed with sleep so it's not probably a good idea to study in your room because what typically happens when students are hanging around a residence hall or a dorm room is their friends will come through saying hey do you want to go shoot hoop or hey do you want to play cards or hey do you want to play this video game with me or oh do you want to go to the mall or don't do your school work come and have a coffee with me and you might be able to say no to one or two invitations but by the time the third invitation comes around the best of us are going to break down and go off with their friends so your room is not the best place to study and I joke with my students and I say get out get out get out do not study in your room find a suitable place to study that works for you um, I didn't even find that the library worked for me when I was in college because my friends knew where I sat and they'd come find me and distract me. I ended up having to find a classroom building and hide myself in a classroom where nobody could find me so I could get good studying done. So you kind of have to assess your personality and how much you're going to cave to peer pressure and find that one place to study that works for you. So tip number one, find a suitable place to study. So tip number one was find that regular place to study and I would say find a regular time to study as well. So now that you've got your weekly schedule done you can look and you can find certain time blocks throughout the day that you're going to study. Some people prefer to study from 3 to 6 in the afternoon. Some people prefer to study from 12 to 3. Whatever time block you can find on each day and it may vary each day find that one regular time block on each day to study and try not to veer away from that. Some people say it takes 30 days to form a habit, a semester is only 15 weeks, so you want to get into a habitual regular time that you study as soon as you can at the beginning of every semester. And the next tip is, and I've already discussed this to a certain extent when I talk to you about your circadian rhythm, is study at your periods of maximum alertness. And I'll just say to students, don't work against your biology studying at night when you're fatigued. Try to study during the day because most people, they're maximally alert during the daytime hours. So find those time blocks during the day that work for you and study at those times. Then what I say to students is limit your blocks of study times to only two hours at a time and alternate courses. Um, you kind of have to find out what your attention span is for certain subjects and it may vary for certain subjects. I was a psychology major so I could immerse myself in psychology for three hours at a time and my mind wouldn't wander and I wouldn't get bored. But take another subject matter, it might only be 45 minutes to an hour before I would start getting fatigued and my mind would wander. So your study time may vary depending on your interest level in the course and how long you're able to do sustained periods of studying for each course. Whatever that time is that you find, let's say that your attention span tends to be about an hour, study for an hour, take a 15 minute break. Study for another hour, take a 15 minute break. But never study for more than two hours on any one course at a time. And again, if you go back to your weekly calendar, set specific goals for each study unit. What do I mean by that? do specific page numbers. So you want to write down things like, I'm going to outline a chapter. That's a specific goal. I'm going to read chapter 8 from pages 55 to 75. That's a specific goal. I'm going to make an appointment at the writing center to help with my brainstorming for my paper. So make sure, in as much as you can, when you're setting a goal, be very specific and put detail on your study goals. What you also want to do is, since we all tend to gravitate towards the courses that we're most interested in and spend more time on those, take a look at your four or five courses and when you're setting up your study schedule for the week, make sure you spend enough time studying to do justice to each subject. So that means if you're going to give two hours to economics, you're going to give two hours to anatomy and physiology, you're going to give two hours to your literature course. So whatever subjects you have, make sure you give equal time to each subject matter. The other tip I have for you is attempt to complete all assignments as soon as possible after your classes. And this, this tip comes out of the research on memory retention. If you hear a lecture, it's going to be a lot quicker for you to do the reading assignment or do that homework assignment for that class when the information is still fresh in your memory. So don't wait two or three days after you've heard 
the lecture. Try to do your assignments for that class as soon as you've heard the lecture. The quicker you can do the assignment after your lecture, the less you're going to forget the information and the better off you're going to be. Provide for a spaced review. What do I mean by that? Well, there are two terms in study skills um, world. One is called a space practice and one is called a mass practice. A space practice is doing a little bit each day before the test or exam. Mass practice is a fancy way of saying cramming. So when you're doing reading or studying for a class, cramming is trying to do everything the night before. Instead, what you want to do is a spaced review when you're studying for tests. So start five or six days before and do a little bit each day. So always provide for a spaced review and leave yourself enough time to do that. Plan a schedule of balanced activities. That goes back to our 888 formula. You do want to have enough time for your leisure time, enough time for your sleep, and enough time for your schoolwork. You can't be work, 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 work all the time because eventually you'll be operating in burnout. So each day what you want to do is plan some kind of leisure activity. Make sure that when you're studying you have some kind of reward. I know for me, taking a Diet Coke break is a reward, so I might do two hours worth of work, do two hours worth of my emails, whatever it is that I have to do for work, and then I'll take a 15-minute Diet Coke break. So make sure that you have breaks in between and that your day is balanced with leisure activities and with schoolwork. So trade time, don't steal it. What do I mean by that? Well, what happens is students might overschedule themselves. and. Inevitably, there's going to be something that comes up, like your friends will say to you, hey, listen, I got these concert tickets for Thursday night, and you already have a bunch of things scheduled for Thursday night, um, starting work on a particular paper or reading for a particular class, and you think, oh, I can't go to the concert because I've already got my schedule for Thursday night all set up. Make sure you leave enough flexibility in your schedule that if something unexpected comes up, you can flip-flop times that you're going to be accomplishing your goals. And that way you always have time for your leisure activities and for your academic activities. So I hope you'll implement all of the tips that I gave you during this lecture. Um, remember the key is implementation. You may know how to do it, but the key is actually going through and doing it. And by using some of these strategies, I'm confident you're going to be able to manage your time more effectively throughout this semester.